It really is. I, the book of Job is a tremendous book that's neglected by many people in our society, and many, sadly, within the Lord's Church. I remember several years ago, I sat and talked to a, an adult Bible class teacher who was saddled with the task of teaching the book of Job. And he said to me, Justin, I've got the first lesson, and it's chapter 1. I've got the second lesson, it's chapter 2. But the third lesson is chapters 3 through 42. And he didn't know how, how to cover it in 45 minutes. Thankfully, many have begun to see the value that is found in this book. And I appreciate the lectureship committee and the elders of the congregation here for choosing this theme to be able to go into the book of Job beyond chapter 1, beyond chapter 2, and even beyond the questions that God will ask later on in the book to really dig into some of the issues that Job has to deal with. While some may be content with just knowing about the patience of Job, we need to dig into what really happens in this book. Francis Anderson commented about this book. They said, the task of understanding it is as rewarding as it is strenuous. For this help, the modern student has a rich legacy from the labors of the past. It is a tribute to the greatness of the book that the work of interpreting it is never finished. After each fresh exploration, the challenge to scale the heights remains. One is constantly amazed at its audacious theology and at the magnitude of its intellectual achievement. Job is a prodigious book in the vast range of its ideas, the broad coverage of its human experience, the intensity of its passions, and the immensity of the concept of God, and least, not least, in the superb literary craftsmanship. Homer Haley would add that the book of Job is something of a microcosm of, of man's efforts to learn and understand true wisdom to deal with the, the struggles and the problems of this life, and, and he's right. When we look at the struggles we have, when we look at the issues that we have, we find in Job a spirit that we can emulate, uh, one that we can look at and, and see how did he handle these things and, and why did these things happen to him. The theme for this hour's lecture, which will be continued on through the rest of the week, is empathetic failures. Now, I've got to tell you, when Andy called and asked me to speak, there were two thoughts run through my head, uh, surprise and excitement for being asked to speak, and then fear because I didn't know what empathetic meant. And I'm going to speak on that. So as I'm talking to him, he doesn't know this, I'm on the computer Googling up the word empathetic to make sure I, this is something I want to do. The word empathetic simply means the capacity for participation in another's feelings or ideas. And so what we're dealing with this lesson is empathetic failures. How there are those within the book of Job that failed at understanding Job's feelings, understanding what's going on in his life. The text under consideration for us this afternoon is Job chapter 13 and verse 4. A very simple verse yet with a great deal of information for us to look at today. Here Job says to his friends, but you are forgers of lies, you are all worthless physicians. You're all worthless physicians. I, I don't know if I've ever been called a worthless physician. I may be called a lot of things, but I don't know if anybody's ever said this to me. I don't know if I've ever had this attitude in my heart to call someone a worthless physician. So the question that I, I want to begin with this afternoon is to, to look at the context of this. Why does Job say this about his friends? And then after we look at the context of Job 13 and verse 4, we will look at some applications about worthless physicians. In the first two chapters of the book, as we've studied before, we know that Job's suffering has been caused by Satan. We know where his suffering comes from. Now the thing is, Job, of course, doesn't understand this. Job doesn't have the first two chapters laid out for him to explain to him why all these terrible things are going to happen to him. The student of the book of Job understands this. We have that curtain pulled aside and, and, and we have this explanation delivered to us before we even get into chapter 3, before his friends begin to speak. We already understand why Job has suffered. And so we have that luxury, but Job does not. And it's important to keep in mind that his friends don't have that luxury either. They haven't been explained, it hasn't been explained to them why Job is suffering. And so with that in mind, we begin to make sense of the situation in which Job finds himself and, and why he calls them worthless physicians. 
We know prior to our text that there are speeches that have been prompted from these four men, chapters 3 through 13. But the question remains, why would Job call his friends worthless physicians? You know, they, they had heard of the, the trouble that Job has, has gone through. They've traveled a great distance to come be with their friends. As a matter of fact, they've sat in stunned silence for seven days, unable to speak. I have an elder, I had an elder one time give me some very good advice. He said, when I was a young preacher, he, he, he said, Justin, or preaching, started out preaching very early. He, he said, sometimes it's just good to go and sit. Even if you don't have the words, if you don't have the, the things that may be able to comfort at that time, occasionally it would just be good to go and sit with them. Because that's what Job's friends did. They went and sat. They looked at his situation, and they didn't know what to say, so they sit in silence for a period of time. So here you've got these friends of his who have traveled a great distance, who obviously care about the situation he's in, and they're, they're trying to comfort him with their silence. So how could they have been worthless? Well, let's begin, as was already stated in, a, in the last lesson, a few of the, situation, a few of the things that the situation that Job found himself in. In Job chapter 3 and verse 3, he began by detesting the day of his birth. May the day perish in which I was born, and the night in which it is said a male child is conceived. He concludes it down in verse 26 by saying, I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Now it's interesting at this point, as we begin into chapter 3, that we don't read about Satan anymore. We read about his work and the things that he's done in the first two chapters, but he kind of backs off into the shadows. As one writer put it, he's going to disappear into the wings, and what follows will be furthered by the friends of Job. So Satan's still at work here, but, but he's not taking a very active role as he did in the first two chapters. And so Job begins by t detesting the day of his, his birth, and, and he, he's in great pain and great anguish, as we've, we've already studied. And the basic thrust of Eliphaz's response to Job in chapters 4 and 5 is that you've sinned and that you're being chastened by God. Now, could you imagine that? I, I have, as, as Andy brought up, I have three very wonderful children, and I love them dearly. And, and I can't imagine if all three of them were taken from me in this life in one quick strike. And then the first person who walks up to me says, Job, or Justin, the reason that these things are happening to you, the reason your children have died is because you have sinned. Well, after I probably pick myself up off the floor, he'd have to pick himself up off the floor. Because I couldn't imagine someone saying that to me. That my children have died, that all that I have is gone because of something I have done. When I know I haven't done those things. As a matter of fact, Job's friends remark in Job chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Remember now, whoever perished being innocent. Where were the upright, or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And from this point on, we're going to find in our context that his friends begin their insinuations. They begin the accusations leveled against Job. Homer Haley comments on this. He says, although the, the friends that had said things that were true, the implications and the applications to their points were false. We know it is a biblical doctrine, don't we? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, that whatever you sow, that's what you'll reap. We know that if we sow iniquity, we'll reap trouble. We understand if we sow to the flesh, will the flesh reap corruption? That is a biblical doctrine. We know from Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20 and 24, that the soul that sins, it shall die. We know that there are consequences. God has laid that out all throughout his word. There are consequences. He began with the consequences with Adam and Eve, didn't he? Eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There are consequences. We know that to be true. But we also know that not all suffering is the result of sin. Something that my Lord said in, in Luke chapter 13. And he says it twice, but he intermingles it, those things, with something that's being described to him. You remember about the Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with sacrifices. And he asked, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the rest because these things happened to them? And then he gives another illustration. He talks about the Tower of Siloam that fell on the 18 individuals and they perished. And he says, do you think they were worse sinners than everyone else because they died? 
Now, in the midst of this discussion, of course, Jesus says, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. But here's the thing. Our world is not a world of retribution. Our world, a tower, does not watch us walking by and say, that's a bad person, bam, and fall on you. And that's what the Lord is trying to teach. The, wor the world does not bring upon retribu retribution upon us, but God will if we continue in sin. And so not all suffering is the result of personal sin. It may be the result of someone else's sin. It may be bad decisions someone else has made. But the suffering that Job goes through is not because of anything he's done. And we know that. He doesn't. His friends don't know that. They only hold to the position that they have that Job has sinned and brought this destruction upon themselves because this is all they know. Bildad in chapter 8, you recall, tells Job to repent. Zophar goes so far in chapter 11, verse 3, 4, and 5 to say Job is a liar and God needs to correct you. I start to understand why he calls them worthless positions. I'm starting to get it now. Why does he call them worthless physicians? These friends of his. Because through all his struggle and through all his suffering, they've called him a liar. They've called him one that God needs to correct. J. Vernon McGee makes an interesting comment about the accusations of these friends and Job's response to them. Here he says, Job is making a, a, a plea here. He says, I can't tell you how terrible, I, I can't tell you how horrific my grief is. I can't explain to you this awful thing that's happened to me. And all that Eliphaz can look, do is look at him and say, you have some secret sin that you need to correct. That's not always the right thing to say. That's not always the words of wisdom that, that we need to hear. So we begin to understand the statement of Job. You are forgers of lies. You're worthless physicians. Job has not sinned. Job has not sown iniquity. The suffering that he is going through is not a result of those things. And so here we stand, condemning his friends. Here we stand, ready to pass judgment upon them. How dare they behave in such a manner? Are there times we act like worthless physicians? Are there times that we become like the friends of Job? <laughs> well... Preacher, I don't know anybody that's going through the things that Job's going through and has stood there and told them they're a liar. So, no, I'm, well, here's the application. There are times when we can become like worthless physicians. What makes for a worthless physician? I would suggest this to you this afternoon. A lack of brotherly love. This is obviously seen as his friends begin to speak. A lack of brotherly love. When one is sick physically, you seek out professional advice, don't you? You seek out professional help. Someone that can diagnose your problem. Specialists may be consulted. Other doctors may be called in. We would not be pleased with a doctor if I were to fall down these steps this afternoon on my way out and break my leg. And you take me out here to the local hospital and I, I know I'm in pain and it hurts and the bone's sticking out and it's obvious there's something that's wrong. For a doctor to look at me and say, Justin, you're doing fine. Get on that plane and enjoy your trip to Denver. I'd say, are you out of your mind? We call that person a worthless physician. But I want to tell you something. There, there are a lot of people who are, are hurting emotionally. There are a lot of people who are hurting spiritually. They're coming to us and they're looking for help. And all that we can do is be warmed and filled, go in peace. We're worthless physicians. Worthless physicians. When we turn others away who are in pain, emotionally or physically, here, lack of brotherly love is an indication of a worthless physician. Jesus taught a very powerful lesson about love, didn't he? Over in Matthew chapter 22, when he was asked, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? You remember he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. There's the bar that God's raised. There's what he wants us to attain to. Oh, by the way, the second commandment, they didn't even ask about the second commandment. They asked what was the greatest. But he tells them the second commandment is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two things hang all the law and the prophets. 
Paul would say over in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. As Christians, we've got to show compassion to those who are in need, to those who are hurting, not just offer lip service. Jesus taught his disciples something very important. You know how you tell a disciple of Christ? By the love they show for one another. A very simple principle. John 13, 34, and 35. Disciples of different teachers are known by their habits, some, some particular creed, maybe some particular rite. But the disciples of Christ were known by the love they had for each other. I think we become empathetic failures if we don't keep the commandments to love one another. Have you read 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21? I'm sure you have. Have you let it sink into you? The, I brought this point up one time, a long time ago, preaching a lesson on brotherly love. And I read, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he, does not love how, uh, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment, and I stress the word commandment. And when I said the word commandment, I could see three or four people sitting in the back like I'd knocked them out of the pew. They'd never heard this before. Maybe they heard it, maybe they didn't understand it. This is a commandment, not advice, but a commandment that we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Stand up and proclaim, I love God. You better love your brother also. Otherwise, you're a worthless physician. There's another group that makes for a worthless physician. That would be false teachers. I think this goes without saying, but I'm going to say quite a bit about it. False teachers. Millions are listening to men and women that blaspheme the word of God. They sit in their audiences, they sit in front of the television, they sit in front of the radio, and they listen to these people blaspheme the word of God, believing that their spiritual condition is secure. When in fact they're being condemned. Remember what Jude wrote in Jude 4? About false teachers when when they turn our grace of God into lewdness. Paul kind of, he, he, well, he, he expounds upon this in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? The grace may abound. Let's just sin more. Because God's grace is so great that every time I sin, I get a little bit more grace. Turn on the television. That's what you hear. God's grace will take care of whatever you go through. False teachers are telling people, that it's acceptable to sin because grace is greater than sin. False teachers are worthless physicians when they promote peace when there is none. This is the problem that Jeremiah had to deal with in Jeremiah chapter 8. For they he have healed the hurt of, my do uh, of the daughter of my people slightly, saying peace, peace when there is none. False teachers are worthless physicians when they promote the traditions of men over the commands of God, don't they? Jesus talks about this in Mark 7. All too well, you reject the commandment of God and keep your tradition. False teachers are worthless physicians when they flatter you with enticing words. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their father to the false prophets. <coughs> false teachers are worthless physicians when they teach what others only want to hear. There's a, for lack of a better term, mega community church out where we live. And I, I read in the paper, they did a big write-up about them. 3,000 people go there, and they had to split off into two different places to, to accommodate people driving from great distances. And so they had a big write-up in the paper over their growth and how it started. And it started with a man and a wife and a couple other people in their house, and they, they began to attract followers. And when you read, would read through this article, you understood how they did it, because they are not judgmental. You know what that means. You walk through the doors, we'll accept whatever you do. We'll tell you whatever you need to hear. And I know people who go to these, the, this place and, and the satellite, what they call them, satellite churches. And you can tell they've been told whatever they need to hear to get through those doors. When we do that, brethren, we become false teachers. We become worthless physicians. Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, The time will come when they not endure sound doctrine. But according to their desires, they will have itching ears. They will heap for themselves teachers 
Turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. False teachers are worthless physicians that can only bear bad fruit. What did Jesus say? You know, if you know them by their fruit? The worth of the gospel has been attested down through the ages by characters which it has produced. The world's salt, the world's light. No other teaching than what's in this book has produced this. No other teaching has been able to pass the supreme test. There are lots of new systems of theology, but we know them by their fruit. False teachers are worthless physicians because they are against Christ. John dealt with this, you recall in 2 John 7, about the Antichrist. Those that would be against Christ. Those that would say Christ did not come in the flesh. False teachers, worthless physicians. But there's a third group that I want to suggest to you this afternoon that make for worthless physicians. The writer of Proverbs said in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, Tramp a child in the way they should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. I would suggest to you broken homes produce worthless physicians. Broken homes are worthless physicians. We as parents have a responsibility to train up a child. Not just tell. Not just tell them how they need to do things, but train them. I think there's a big difference between telling and training. One of the things I've tried to do with, with my son, Ben, he's, he's 15 now, taller than me, smarter than me. But he's got a little money in his pocket for mowing yards. And he decided he wanted a new desk in his room. Well, I've put together furniture for years, and I know how to do it. I had him in there training him, showing him how to do it. And so when he decided he wanted a new headboard or whatever it was for his bed, he did most of the work. That's training a child. We need to train up our children, show them by our example how they need to live. And I believe parents have a tremendous responsibility to teach their children in the ways of God. And they become worthless physicians when they abdicate that role. When they tell the children, do as I say, not as I do, they're worthless physicians. Can you truly expect a, a son not to go out and drink when he sees his father come home drunk every Friday night? Do you think a, a, a young girl can learn from a mother that is not faithful? Children are looking for stability in the home. There was an article that was written in this, just not too long ago in this year that said children need to have parents who are dependable. Children need to have parents that are responsible. Children get stability from schedules being set. Living in conditions that are clean, conditions that are calm. And they went on to talk about the type of music you play, the, the, how loud you, you turn it up, the examples, the, the influence that you have in your children's life. Key to stability, they said, for a child too, is how the adults in, this, in that child's life treat one another. Children seek, seek stability and support from their parents. There's no doubt about that. So we understand when Paul writes in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that there needs to be good examples, not worthless physicians, a young couple that, that's that newly married. Now think about this. Those of you that have been married for a while, think back to the first year of your marriage. Bed of roses, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I've been married over 16 years now, thankful for the, the patience that Christina has shown me. But for the first year of marriage, I, people say, How, how's married life? Well, it's been a real kick in the head. I mean, it's not what, you know, we, we don't think, what is marriage? Well, you don't really know until you get into it. So imagine a young couple looking f for guidance, and all they can find around them are people cheating on each other. Imagine a home where the mother and father provide structure and love for the family. Paul makes it clear, wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
Paul would talk about the older women in Titus chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, that they admonished the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Too, old, too often, the older women have left poor examples for the younger women to follow. Worthless physicians. So what do we do? We need to turn to the great physician, don't we? I couldn't help but when, I, when I, Andy told me the, the title of this lesson, Worthless Physicians, so the, in my mind I, I started thinking about the lesson. I thought, well, the cure to a worthless physician is a great physician. We need to turn to the great physician. Jesus in Mark chapter 2, here's the question that was being asked of his disciples about Jesus associating with sinners, with, with tax collectors, eating with them. And he responds, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I didn't come to call the, the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, the proper place of Jesus would have been around the sick. It, it would have been around the sick physically, but it also around the sick spiritually. That's what makes him a great physician. That's what makes him so wonderful. Jesus cannot and will never be listed in the same category as Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar because he is our great physician. And the idea of a physician is not uncommon in the scripture. As a matter of fact, in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 22, Jeremiah talks about, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Do you suppose they didn't have anybody that could treat illnesses at that point in time? I'm sure they did, but that's not what he's getting at, is it? Is there no physician there... Is there no one to, to help their spiritual condition? Why then is there no recovery for the health of my da the daughter of my people? God would be the one that could heal Israel. Jesus is the one that could heal us. Barclay wrote about this passage. He said, the physician is the man who sees what is wrong. For no cure can follow until the cause of the troubles diagnosed. Jesus Christ can diagnose the sickness of sin. He can reveal just where that sickness attacks each individual. How does he do that? I think it goes back to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful. And then here's the key. His name will be called Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know what a counselor does. And I've had counselors in school. I had a wonderful counselor in, in, in high school. Probably got me out of more trouble than I would have ever needed to get into. But you know what a counselor does? Guides you down a path that's best for you. So why is Jesus called counselor? Because he's able to guide us in paths of righteousness. In him are laid up all the treasures of knowledge. He is properly equipped to redeem his people. He is properly equipped to teach. Even at an early age, you remember Luke chapter 2? Even at an early age, he's, he's in the temple, and the people are marveling at his understanding of the scriptures. They're, they're amazed at, at what, he, what he knows. In reference to himself, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 42, Jesus said, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, you buy, students of the Bible, you, you, you all know the, the wisdom of Solomon. You know the p wisdom that he possessed. You, you know that the Queen of Sheba, she traveled a great distance just to come here uh, from Solomon. And when she got there and saw his greatness and saw his wealth and saw his wisdom, she says the half hadn't been told. And so we know about the wisdom of Solomon. But in the case of Christ, when he says a greater than Solomon is here, he is well equipped to answer the struggles of our lives. In John chapter 6 and verse 68, after his great lesson on the bread of life, when many people who couldn't handle this saying turned away, he looks at his disciples and said, will you go away also? What does Peter say? Where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. You're the great physician. Who do we go to? Because everyone else is a worthless physician. He has the words of eternal life. He has the words to a more abundant life, John chapter 10 and verse 10. He has the words of reconciliation to God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19. You know, Jesus, 
is considered the great, great physician because he, unlike the, the friends of Job, has experienced the same trials and temptations that we've gone through. We know those avenues of temptation that Satan uses, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We know the way that Satan is trying to destroy us as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And you know, he did those same things to my Lord. He tempted him. And yet, he was without sin. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, No temptation is overtaking you such as common to man. Jesus is no stranger to our temptations. The writer of Hebrews dramatically states, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. It is admittedly easier to sympathize and to be empathetic toward those that have gone through the same thing we have. It's hard to sit and comfort someone who is going through something that you've not gone through. But when you go through those trials, it becomes easier, doesn't it? The friends of Job, they never lost all their possessions. They never lost their entire family in one quick stroke. All they could do is sit there and condemn him for the sin that they alleged he had committed. Even as he proclaims his innocence. And here's the thing about Jesus I want to tell you today. The thing about Jesus is he won't do that. He won't look at us and condemn us. He'll look at us and as our mediator defend us. Make us righteous. We all struggle with the difficulties of life. And we know that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We don't, have, we don't have a worthless physician. We've got a great physician. An individual who can guide us, counsel us, provide grace and defense in time of need. It's been said, and I, I, like, I like the statement, that the friends of Job did well until they began to speak. They did real well until they opened their mouths. They came not to console, but they came to condemn. Job was right, absolutely right, to call them forgers of lies, worthless physicians. In his time of suffering, in his time of need, they provided no relief. As a matter of fact, they may have added to the grief. In his own defense, in chapter 12, Job declares that he knows that people suffer for sin. But he goes on to say in verse 13 regarding God, with him are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. So Job acknowledges, yes, people suffer, but God knows what's going on. God knows what's best. God is indeed in control. And even though Job may not completely understand why all this has happened to him, he still trusts in God. And toward the end, when he is rebuked, he repents. Occasionally, we will become like Eliphaz, we'll become like Bildad, we'll become like Zophar. Occasionally, we will become conceited in our own arrogance. We'll sit at the bedside of one who is suffering, we'll, we'll sit across the table from an individual who is emotionally struggling, and we will presume to know everything that's going on in their lives. Let's not become worthless physicians, but let's heed the words of Job. Oh, that you would be silent, and that be your wisdom.